Chapters thirty seven and thirty eight of When Shadows Die by E. D. E. and Southworth. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Bridget Gage. Chapter thirty seven The Dawn of a Brighter Day. We liked Myrtle Grove so well that we made it our home for three years. Its quiet beauty seemed so soothing and restful after the terrible grandeur of Enderby Castle and the mournful desolation of Weird Waste. I had a little school of poor children, and a small number of aged and invalid cottagers, whose necessities gave me interest and occupation. My father was now a recluse and a student, passing most of his time in the small library among his favorite authors, or, if the weather was very fine, sitting in his leather chair under one of the trees in the thickly shaded grounds at the back of the house, with a book in his hand. My brother came every Christmas and every midsummer to spend his vacation with us. As I mentioned before, he knew nothing of my short, disastrous marriage, and was to know nothing of it. His talk, when he was at home, was full of Angus Anglesia, his one dear friend. When he was praising this hypocrite, I was forced to make some excuse to get out of the room, or to keep a painful silence in it, for I could not contradict him, or expose Anglesia's villainy to me, without betraying facts that it was desirable should be kept from him. Even my father, who knew now every circumstance attending my imprudent marriage, knew nothing of Anglesia's insulting proposal to me. Pride, delicacy, and consideration for that dear father's feelings prevented me from telling him. Yet I made him understand that under my peculiar circumstances I did not want any visitors, especially gentlemen visitors, at Myrtle Grove, of course always excepting the vicar, the doctor, the lawyer, and my dear brother, who could scarcely indeed be called a visitor. In this manner, without having to mention Anglesia's name, I kept my brother's dear friend from coming to Myrtle Grove. Before the commencement of every vacation, undaunted by previous refusals, Glennon would write from his college and ask leave to bring his friend home with him. My father would then bring the letter to me and ask my opinion. I would always tell him, what was the truth, that my soul shrank from visitors and he would write something to the same effect in his reply to Glennon. My brother took this very hard, and on his arrival at home would always complain that it was, in schoolboy slang, a jolly shame he could not have Anglesia to spend the holidays with him, as he had always been accustomed to do. He said that he did not know what had come over Friday. She had been very fond of Anglesia when they were at Brighton together. So fond of him that he, Glennon, had hoped Anglesia might one day be his brother-in-law, as he was now his brother in heart. I said nothing in self-defense at all, but left it to my father to explain, what he assumed to be the truth, that I had no especial objection to Anglesia, but that the state of my health unfitted me to entertain company. This generally satisfied him, at least for the time being. At length, when little more than three years had passed, my father began to grow weary of our long seclusion from the world, and proposed that we should make another tour of the continent, avoiding as much as possible the crowded resorts of tourists, and betaking ourselves to quieter scenes. I consented to this, as I did to every plan proposed by my father. I made but one condition. The Easter holidays were approaching, and my brother was expected to come to Myrtle Grove, to spend the time with us as usual. I therefore proposed to my father that Glennon should now invite his friend to accompany him to Myrtle Grove, while I myself should go for a week and take lodgings at the dairyman's cottage in Kent where my child was at nurse. You may wonder why I should have done this, knowing the character of Anglesia as I did. I have sometimes wondered at the same act. But I think it was from affection for Glennon I acted. I knew how he longed to have Anglesia with him at Myrtle Grove. I wished to gratify that longing. I knew that nothing I could do could either cement or sever the bonds of that strong friendship. I knew also that Anglesia never had and never would show his cloven foot to Glennon, or that even if he should do so, Glennon would never tolerate it. He would fly from it. I felt instinctively that Anglesia could never harm my brother. More than willingly, gladly, my father agreed to my plan. He wanted to gratify his son. So I wrote immediately to see if I could obtain lodgings, for change of air, at the dairy farm. In good time came a favorable answer. Then my father wrote to Glennon, authorizing him to invite his friend to spend the Easter holidays with him at Myrtle Grove. I did not wait for the arrival of the visitor, but on the Wednesday before Easter I set out alone for Kent, 
meaning to engage some country girl in the neighborhood of the dairy to wait on me while in lodgings. I reached the dairy about four o'clock on that Wednesday afternoon, and found my son, now a fine boy over three years old, in the rosiest health and most boisterous spirits. He sprang into his auntie's arms, and covered her with caresses before he began to search her pockets and her handbag for the sweetmeats and toys she was accustomed to bring him. A dainty tea-table was waiting for me in a charming cottage parlor. So Mary Chester coaxed my nephew from his auntie's arms, and showed me into a clean, neat, fresh bedroom, snow-white as all delectable bedrooms were in the days before the decoration craze spread over the land. There I laid off my bonnet and washed off the railroad dust. And then I returned to the parlor, where my nephew was allowed to join me at the tea-table, sitting up in a high armchair. That night Mary Chester waited on me as a lady's maid, but the next day I procured the country girl I had been thinking of. I spent a really happy week at the dairy with my child and his foster brother. These two children were so fond of each other that it was a comfort and delight to me to think of them together. Mary Chester had no other children, and she was entirely devoted to them. John Chester, her husband, was a fine, wholesome, honest young man, bearing an excellent character in the neighborhood. We all went to the parish house together on Easter Sunday, leaving the two baby boys at home in charge of Mary Chester's grandmother, who was too infirm to sit through the long church service, but who was quite equal to the care of two children for a few hours. As Easter week drew to a close, I began to think of returning to Myrtle Grove. But I did not leave the dairy until I received a letter from my father, informing me that the visitors had departed. Then I loaded my little son, his foster brother, and his attendants with presents suited to the conditions of each. I returned heartfelt thanks to Mary Chester for her excellent care of my nephew, and paid her six months in advance. Finally, on the Thursday after Easter, I bade them all good-bye, and set out to return to Myrtle Grove. I found my father in excellent health, but impatient to start on our journey. I hurried my preparations, and two days after we left England for Germany, where it was my fate first to meet you, Abelforce, who made all the happiness of my life. CHAPTER Thirty Eight, NEW LIFE We avoided the highways and public resorts of travel, the grand railway lines, the great cities, the famous spas, the big hotels, and we sought out the byways, unfrequented hamlets and villages on mountain heights or in forest steppes, as yet undiscovered by the eyes, unprofaned by the feet of speculators. We had seen enough of the splendor and magnificence of Europe. We wished to see some of its real working life. Yes, we wish to lose ourselves and find repose in obscurity. Yet where can one go and avoid fate? Or where, let me ask you, Abel, can we travel and not meet an American tourist? You remember the day and the place of our first meeting. It was on a glorious afternoon in July, when the sun was sinking in the west and kindling all the horizon into a conflagration. We were in a little chalet at the foot of the mountain. We had come out to view the magnificence of the sunset. The cowherd was penning his cattle, the shepherd was folding his sheep. Coming down the mountain path, we saw a solitary tourist, knapsack on back and alpenstock in hand. That was my first sight of you, Abel, a tall, athletic, black-bearded man, whom we all first took for a Tyrolesian. You came up to the door of the chalet, raised your hat to us, and asked the cottagers if you could have a night's lodging. Do you remember, Abel? Of course, you could be accommodated— Roughly, we were all roughing it for the time being. So our acquaintance began. That night, you introduced yourself to us by name and nationality, Abel Force of Maryland, United States. And when my father, in return, named himself and me, your face brightened. You told him that on leaving America you had brought letters of introduction, among which was one from your late minister to St. James, addressed to the Earl of Enderby. These letters were all with your luggage at your hotel in Bern, where you had left them to come on this pedestrian excursion to the mountain. You added that you had missed Lord Enderby in England, and learned that he was traveling on the continent, that you deemed yourself strangely fortunate in having thus met him, and would present your credentials in the form of the ex-minister's letter as soon as we should reach Bern. The next day we all returned to Bern in company, you at my father's invitation, taking a seat in our carriage. At the Bernerhof Hotel we stopped but one night. There you found and presented your letter, to prove that you were no impostor, you said. 
you joined our company and travelled where we travelled and stopped where we stopped why should i repeat this to you you know it already only because it is a visible link in the chain of our destiny that long summer abel we spent together that long summer every day of which drew our hearts nearer and nearer even my father who was ever most reserved to all but oldest friends and nearest kin came to love you like a son i feeling then for the first time all the bitter significance of my own antecedents resisted the sweet influence that was flowing into my soul yet resisted it in vain you know how silently our love grew during those delightful weeks and months we lived and travelled together i knew then though we might never marry in this world even as i know now though this confession may part us for this earth that we are mates for all eternity there came a day at last when we were all in the ancient city of granada that you went to my father and asked his consent to win me for your wife he told you that he would have a talk with me first and then give you an answer my father came to me and told me all that had passed between himself and you and of your proposal for my hand and he asked me how i felt disposed toward mr force oh the bitter sweet of that moment i told my father i felt so well disposed toward you that but for my past calamity and its living evidence i should accept your hand oh abel my answer did not express the hundredth part of the love the joy and the sorrow that strove in my heart at the time but i had to control myself and speak quietly almost indifferently in the presence of my father he replied by assuring me that he should approve my marriage with mr force that as for my calamity it was no crime no fault of mine but the result of circumstances that i was so perfectly and unquestionably innocent that i might tell the whole story to mr force without losing a degree of his love and esteem at that i became very much alarmed i declared to my father that i should die on the spot if ever my suitor should be told the story of my humiliation for under such circumstances i could not look him in the face and live my father attempted to argue with me to call me morbid my thoughts and feelings extravagant exaggerated but the violence of my agitation bore him down and silenced him at last what am i to say to force he inquired tell him anything you like except the story of my fall or that i can accept his suit you refuse him then i must my father left me i kept my room the whole of that day on the next day i went down to the sitting-room we three occupied in common i certainly did not expect to find you there abel force yet there you were looking a little graver than usual but otherwise behaving as if nothing unusual had been said or done you bade me good morning handed me a chair and inquired after my health well though to my surprise i found you in our sitting-room that morning i certainly expected you to leave our party on the first opportunity but you did not you remained with us and travelled with us as before i shrank from speaking to my father on the subject yet at length i summoned courage to ask him if he had given my answer to you he replied that he had and that you had said you could wait and hope we spent the autumn together as we had spent the summer yet abel we were not happy and as the time for our return to england and your return to america approached and we were to separate to meet no more in this world we both grew more and more miserable as for me my heart seemed wasting to death one day in november my father came to me and said elfrida do you consider me a man of honor or not my dear father what a question was all that i could answer but tell me do you consider me a man of honor yes or no yes my dear father yes a man of the most perfect and most unquestionable honor good then perhaps you will believe me and act upon my words elfrida mr force has this morning begged me to speak for him again again he offers you his hand well my dear father well elfrida he loves you and you know it you love him and he knows it you are both dying for each other and i know that well my dear father i said again have pity on him and on yourself and accept his suit but my past my past which i can never tell him never i could die first elfrida do you believe your father to be a man of honor he inquired for the third time dear sir how can you ask me i have said a man of indubitable honor i replied very well then on the truth of a man on the honor of a peer on the faith of a christian 
"'I swear to you, Elfrida, that you may marry Force without telling him one word of your past trouble,' he said to me, so solemnly that I could not question him. I could only receive his words on the high and sacred ground on which he had spoken them. "'Oh, Abel, was I wrong?' "'I am now going to send Force to see you,' he repeated, as he left the room. Two minutes after that you came to me, and before you left my side I was your promised wife. "'Oh, Abel, was I wrong? Was my father misled by his love for his child? Was I deceived by my love for you? "'Oh, Abel, was I wrong? I knew my father's strict, punctilious sense of honor. I had seen many instances of it. He had been a wealthier man had he been a less fastidiously honorable one. How could I believe that he would sanction a dishonorable concealment of my story, even to secure my own happiness? I could not believe this of my father, and yet I doubted. I doubted. And this concealment never did secure my happiness, but has burdened and darkened and sickened my soul for twenty years. You remember it was arranged that we should be married at Myrtle Grove. We all went to London together. You took apartments at Langham's. We went down to Myrtle Grove, where you were to meet us a fortnight later for the wedding. And what did I do at Myrtle Grove? Prepare for my wedding? No, I passed but one day there, and then I hurried down into Kent and to the dairy farm to see my boy, whom I had not seen for many months. I carried loads of toys, pets, sweetmeats, presents of all sorts. Ah, as if gifts could compensate a child for family recognition, for mother's love. I found the boy in high health, happy in his surroundings, in his foster parents' affections, and in his foster brother's companionship. I spent nearly the whole fortnight preceding my marriage with my child in Kent. Two days before the one appointed for the wedding, I took leave of my boy, half heartbroken at the forced separation, yet comforted with the knowledge that he at least was well and happy, and that he would be faithfully nursed by Mary Chester, and carefully looked after by my father who had promised to adopt and educate him, and to bring him to see me at intervals. I returned to Myrtle Grove, having made no preparations for our marriage, which you know was a strictly private one at the parish church, with only my father to give me away, and my brother and the parish clerk for witnesses. After the wedding, you remember, we took leave of my dear father, who promised to visit us the ensuing spring, but who never kept his promise, because he died suddenly of heart disease during that winter. End of chapter 38。chapters 39 and 40 of When Shadows Die by E. D. E. N. Southworth. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Bridget Gage. Chapter 39 A Clouded Honeymoon. We went down to Liverpool and sailed for America to commence our new life on your Maryland plantation. But, oh, Abel, with a burden of sorrow and remorse on my heart and conscience, which has oppressed and darkened all my days. In the first winter of our marriage news came to us of my father's death, and we mourned him deeply, as you know. Added to grief for his loss was anxiety for the fate of the child he had promised to adopt and educate. No news came to me of my boy. I knew not even if the quarterly payments had been kept up. When we went to Baltimore, however, to buy my mourning outfit— I took the opportunity to send a bill of exchange for a hundred pounds to Mary Chester on account, and asked her to send me news of the boy, and to direct her letter to Bryantown, to which place I intended to go, and I did go at intervals, in hope to find a letter, but none ever came. In the spring I received a terrible shock. Report came that a schooner had been wrecked on the shore, and that but one life had been saved, the life of a child who had been washed up on the sands and found there living. This child, I heard, was at the house of Miss Bayard, who was taking care of him. I went, as everybody went, from curiosity to see the little waif. There happened to be no visitor at the house when I entered Miss Bayard's parlor. She was talkative, as usual, and told me all about the wreck and rescue as it is known to you and to all that community. And she took me into the bedroom adjoining the parlor to look upon the sleeping boy. There he lay upon the clean patchwork quilt, crosswise upon the bed, his flaxen head upon the snowy pillow, a grey woolen shawl spread over him. I approached and stooped to look at his face. Heaven of heavens! Think, think what I must have felt on recognizing my own child. Surprise, delight, wonder, terror, all shook me in turns as I gazed. Eh, hey, ma'am, I don't wonder it gives you a turn. 
It did me, I tell you, the good woman whispered as she stood beside me. In a tumult of emotion, I withdrew from the room. I was afraid the child might open his eyes and see me, and I knew as surely as I had recognized him would the little one remember me and call me by my name as soon as he should set eyes upon me. I was afraid to stay any longer or to ask any more questions, lest I should in some manner betray myself. I took leave of Miss Bayard and left the house. The rescued child was the talk of the county for the whole season. Everyone wondered and speculated as to the boy's birth and social position, but no one could decide upon it, for there was no mark on the nightdress in which the little one had been found. In a few days I heard that you, my beloved and honored husband, you of all men, had taken upon yourself the cost of the child's maintenance and education, that you had engaged to pay Miss Bayard a liberal quarterly allowance for her care of the boy, and to send him to school as soon as he should be old enough to go. Then when I heard this, my better angel urged me to confide in you, to confess the truth and throw myself upon your mercy, the mercy of the truest, noblest, tenderest heart that ever beat. But I dared not do it. The longer I had kept my secret from you, the harder it was to tell. I feared that you would ask me why I had not told you this before our marriage. I feared that you might even part with me. And the longer I had lived with you, the more I loved you. The harder was the thought of parting from you. I could not risk the loss, even though to retain your love seemed almost a theft. I did not tell you, nor did I show any sympathy in your care of the friendless child. I did not go near my boy, lest he should recognize and innocently betray me. So weeks passed into months, and months passed into years. Children came to us and drew our hearts even more closely together, if that were possible, than they had been before. But though I loved our little girls as fondly as ever mother did, yet I loved them no more than I loved the dear boy whom I dared not acknowledge or even look upon. It was not until Roland was at school, and time and change of fashion in clothing and hairdressing had made such alteration in my appearance, that I judged it safe to do so. I first saw my son face to face and shook hands with him. How he stared at me! His mind evidently startled and perplexed, by the phantom of a remembrance he could not fix or define. After that I saw him often and was able to befriend him, but I was often troubled by the look of perplexity in the boy's eyes when they met mine. After a while, however, this shade of memory faded quite away. Years passed, and the old sorrow also seemed to have gone like some morning cloud of spring, leaving scarcely a trace behind. It was on that visit to Niagara Falls, now nearly seven years ago, when I met in the parlor of the hotel the one man I dreaded more than all men or all devils, Angus Anglesia. I saw my danger as soon as our eyes met. I knew that, for the old repulse I had given him at Geneva, he would now take his revenge. Yet I tried to look him down, but I could not. You were by my side. I was obliged to present him to you. You had heard of Angus Anglesia from my father and from my brother, and had heard nothing but praise of the man from them. You gave him a warm welcome. You pressed him to come down and visit us at Mondrier. Afterward, to you alone, I protested against this visit with as much energy as I dared to use— for I could not explain to you why he ought not be our guest. But you thought me somewhat capricious, and declared that you could not withdraw an invitation once given. Then I appealed to him, to any little remnant of pride, honor, or delicacy that might remain somewhere in his depraved nature, not to accept your invitation, not to enter a house which his presence would desecrate. He laughed in my face. He told me that he had already accepted the invitation, and that he meant to make the visit. You know what followed. He came down with us to Mondrier. He cast his eyes upon our dear daughter, Odalite, and on her fortune. Not only on her American fortune, but on her English prospects. Ah, my poor Odalite! She was engaged to be married to her faithful lover, Leonidas Force, who was expected home on the Christmas of that year. And she was as true as truth to her love. She was not for a moment fascinated by the admiration of the brilliant stranger, as people said. She sacrificed herself to save me, and in saving me, to save you and her sisters. Do you know what that snake who had entered our paradise threatened to do, if he were not bought off by the hand and fortune and prospects of our daughter Odalite? He threatened to publish my secret to the whole world. Ah, how I mourned then that I had not told you the sad story before accepting your offer of marriage, and left you free to withdraw or to renew that offer. 
It was too late then. Every year that I had kept a story from you made it harder and more humiliating to tell. And he threatened to tell, not you, that would have been terrible enough, but to tell everybody, to tell the story in the bar rooms of the country inns, at the gentlemen's wine parties and oyster suppers, and everywhere. He would leave our house, take up his lodgings at the Calvert, and spread the venom over the whole community. That would have been fatal. Abel, this story, as he would have told it, must have driven us all in dishonor from the neighborhood. I think it would have killed you. You are strong and brave, and could have borne much, everything but dishonor. That would have killed you. I know it would have driven me mad, and it would have blighted the lives of our children. I was nearly insane even then. Some woman, in such a position, would have committed suicide. But apart from its sinfulness, it would have been ineffectual in my case, as if I had died, he would still have blackmailed Odalite. Some other woman in my position would have killed Anglesia. I knew that, and I knew that if ever man deserved death at a woman's hands, he did it mine, but I was not even tempted so ruthlessly to break the sacred laws of God. Nay, let me say here, that weak, blind, and foolish as I have been, I have not only tried to keep, but I have kept those laws from my youth up. What is it, then, that I have confessed to you? Not a sin, not a fault, but a secret that I have kept from you, because I had not strength enough to tell you, or light enough to know you, or wisdom enough to confide in your wisdom. It was no sin of mine that my marriage was a deception practiced upon me, but it was a great wrong to you to keep the secret of that marriage. You know now the secret of my life, why I consented to sacrifice Odalite to that man, from whom she was saved as by a miracle. Is it a mockery to ask you to pardon this lifelong secret, Abel? I know that you will pardon as freely as God pardons. But when you have seen these lines, you may never afterward see me. Heaven knows. I have written the foregoing confession to put it away, lest death take me unaware, leaving me no time to tell the true story, as I only can tell it. Washington, April 18th, 18 blank. The time has come. I have learned some facts. The villain who spoiled my life, and would have spoiled my daughter's life, was not Angus Anglesia my brother's dearest friend, college mate, and fellow officer, but an impostor bearing his likeness and wearing his name, and now waiting trial as a pirate and a slaver, and having for his mate and fellow prisoner one whom you have known and cared for as Roland Bayard, but who is really Roland Glennon, my son. No, I cannot meet you. When you have read these lines, you will see me no more. CHAPTER Forty. A STARTLING ENCOUNTER When Abel Force had finished reading this manuscript, he sat with it in his hand, thoughtfully gazing at the paper, and almost involuntarily listening for any sound from the adjoining room, where his life lay in a very precarious condition. At last he folded up the parcel and put it into his breast pocket, muttering to himself that he must keep it out of sight until he could get an opportunity to burn it. Then he softly left the room, and went and tapped gently at the door of his wife's chamber. The nurse opened the door. "'How is Mrs. Force?' he inquired. "'She is sleeping under the influence of an opiate. The doctor thinks that if she sleeps well through the night she will be very much better to-morrow morning.' "'Thank heaven!' The nurse softly closed the door, and Mr. Force returned to the little room, where he lighted the gas, for it was growing dark, made some little improvements in his toilet, for it was dinner-time, and then hurried downstairs, for he had eaten nothing since breakfast. He opened the parlor door, and was surprised to find a group of many people gathered around his own party. Wynnette sprang out from them all to meet him. "'Oh, Papa, I have not seen you since early this morning. Where have you been? We had all begun to fear that you were a mysterious disappearance.' "'My dear, I have been closely engaged all day. Who are those with you?' inquired Mr. Force. "'Who? Who but your old friends and neighbors, Mrs. Dorothy Hedge, Miss Susanna Grandier?' and Mr. Samuel Grandier. Come, come and speak to them. They here? Why, how did they find us out? Joshua found them, and brought them here, else they never would have found us out. And yet people say that dogs have no souls. Mr. Force hurried to meet the friends from St. Mary's, and warmly shook hands with them all. We are so sorry to hear that Mrs. Force is indisposed, said Mrs. Hedge, when these greetings were over. She has had a severe nervous shock, such strokes must be epidemic among those who live amid war's alarms, you know, Mrs. Hedge. 
"'Yes, of course, but all war's alarms are not disastrous. "'What a glorious deed young Leonidas Force has done. "'I congratulate you on your nephew, Mr. Force.' "'Thank you, madame. "'Will you take my arm down to dinner? "'There is the gong.' "'The whole party arose and went down into the dining-room, "'and took their places at the table. "'The party filled up a large one. "'After dinner they returned to the drawing-room for a little while, "'and then the visitors from St. Mary's bade good-night, "'and accompanied by Captain Grandier and Rosemary Hedge, "'went away to take possession of their rooms "'at a boarding-house that had been found for them in E Street.' Mr. Force and Lord Enderby lighted a couple of cigars and walked out on the bright and busy avenue to smoke and stroll. Between the gas lamps and the illuminated shop windows, the scene was almost as light as day, and with its crowd of pedestrians as noisy as a fair. Up and down they strolled and smoked, until, tired of being jolted, or, as the Earl put it, walked over, they turned up the west side of Fifteenth Street, where the sidewalk was brilliantly lighted, yet almost vacant of passengers. Here they walked and talked in the cool of the evening, unconscious of a dark figure approaching them from the north end of the street, whose advent was to have the most important effect on the destinies of several of our friends. They were going to meet the form that was approaching them. Both looked up carelessly, and saw a tall, soldierly-looking man, who, coming up, held out his hand with an exclamation of surprise and pleasure. "'Enderby!' The Earl stared for a second, and then seized the offered hand, crying with delight, Anglesia, when did you arrive? This question was put in the same words, at the same time by both. But three days since, answered Lord Enderby. Only this afternoon, replied General Anglesia. I have come to America to see your sister. Let me present you to my brother-in-law, Mr. Force of Mondreer, Maryland. Mr. Force, General Anglesia, late of the East Indian Service. The real Simon Pure, you understand, Abel. The two gentlemen, thus introduced, bowed deeply. "'You say you have come over to see my sister?' inquired the Earl. "'Yes, on very important business. You may judge how important when I tell you that it has brought me across the ocean at such a time as this. My sister is at this time indisposed. I think it will be a day or two before she is capable of attending to any business. But here is her husband.' "'Of course, I am very happy to meet Mr. Force, and shall be ready, at his convenience, to enter upon this business. It concerns Lady Elfrida's first marriage.' "'Now, if Mr. Force had not already learned the truth concerning that first marriage, I know not what might have been the consequences of this sudden announcement. As it was, Lady Elfrida's second husband, with great presence of mind, replied, "'Precisely. I shall be ready to attend to you as soon as you please.' As for Lord Enderby, who had never heard a word about his sister's first marriage, he was considerably startled, but with equal presence of mind recovered himself and said, "'If it is necessary that this matter should be entered upon this evening, we had better withdraw into apartments. We can scarcely discuss important business in the street.' "'You are quite right, and I am at your service,' assented the general. "'But where shall we go? Privacy is hard to be had at any price in this overcrowded city.' "'We have not a private sitting-room at our hotel.' "'Come with me, then,' said Anglesia. "'I have, by a fortunate chance, "'been able to secure a comfortable bedroom "'with a little box of a sitting-room adjoining.' "'A box of a sitting-room! "'What a boon! "'What a blessing in these times!' said the Earl, "'as he turned with the squire and the general "'to walk to the last-mentioned gentleman's hotel. Ten minutes later, "'they were all three seated around a small table,' on which stood a bottle of sherry, some wine-glasses, and cigars. "'My business with Lady Elfrida,' began Anglesia, "'is to restore to her some documents that have been too long, indeed, in my possession, though I did not really anticipate they would ever be called for, as they now appear to be, to confirm her son's claim to the estate of his uncle, Antonio Saviola.' "'Her son?' thought the Earl to himself, but he said nothing. He only looked at Abel Force, whose face was quite impenetrable." I hope the young gentleman is living, and is quite well. Yes, thank you, my stepson is quite well, and a very fine young man altogether. The earl looked from one to the other. Here was a revelation. His sister had been twice married, and she had a living son by her first marriage, and Abel Force knew this, and he himself had never even suspected such a thing. Why had not he, her brother, her only living relative beside her husband and children, been told of this first marriage? Did his father know it, and conspire to keep the secret from him, too? 
Did Anglesia also know it from the first, and confederate with all the other conspirators to keep the secret from him, the son, the brother, the bosom friend? It was very hard on him, the injured earl reflected. In the meantime, the general had taken out from a rolled Morocco case a few parchments, which he spread upon the table, pushing all the glasses together to make room. Then, missing some papers from among the others, he arose, and went into the adjoining chamber to look for it. Lord Enderby seized the opportunity afforded by his temporary absence, to stoop and whisper to the squire. "'This sudden news of my sister's first marriage has fallen like a thunderbolt upon me.' "'Has it?' inquired the squire, with forced calmness. "'I should think so. I had never dreamed of such a thing. Why was it kept a secret from me? Did my father know it?' "'Certainly.' "'My father knew it. Anglesia knew it. You knew it. Why was it kept secret from me?' "'My dear Enderby, because it seemed to your father necessary that it should be kept so,' soothingly replied the squire. "'Was the marriage a discreditable one, then?' "'No, it was not.' "'Then why, in the name of heaven, could it not have been announced?' "'My dear Enderby, secrecy is not always wrong and foolish. It is sometimes wise and right. It was so in this instance.' and I may further promise to satisfy you of this in a few hours. When you married my sister, did you know that she had been married before, and that she had a living son by that first marriage? Most certainly I did, said Mr. Force, with emphasis. And yet I remember, I swear that I remember, she signed her name to her marriage register with you, Elfrida Glennon. Hush, here comes Anglesia, said the squire, as the general entered the room. End of chapter 40《ハッシュタグのつぶやき文字で検索してみてください。ハッシュタグのつぶやき文字で検索してみてください。ハッシュタグのつぶやき文字で検索してみてください。ハッシュタグのつぶやき文字で検索してみてください。ハッシュタグのつぶやき文字で検索してみてください。ハッシュタグのつぶやき文字で検索してみてください。ハッシュタグのつぶやき文字で検索してみてください。ハッシュタグのつぶやき文字で検索してみてください。ハッシュタグのつぶやき文字で検索してみてください。ハッシュタグのつぶやき文字で検索してみてください。ハッシュタグのつぶやき文字で検索してみてください。ハッシュタグのつぶやき文字で検索してみてください。ハッシュ Mr. Force, thoroughly informed of that circumstance, could bow acquiescence. This assent was supposed to answer also for Lord Enderby, who, however, knew nothing about it, and the general continued, "'You know that at that time I was a very young man, scarcely having attained my majority. I had a warm friendship for, and a youthful sympathy with, the young lovers. Yet I would have dissuaded Saviola from the hasty marriage if I could have done so.' but who can turn an Italian lover from his love chase? Seeing that I could do nothing to prevent the marriage that was sure to come off, sooner or later, for her father was in the east, and her brother was at Eton, and a minor, and she herself only in the care of two teachers, for whom she had neither love nor esteem, I determined to do a brother's or a father's part by her, at least so far as going with the mad pair, and seeing that the marriage ceremony was duly and lawfully performed in Scotland." But you have heard all this before, and I am wasting time, perhaps, in trying to excuse myself. Your course in that affair needs no excuse, but rather the gratitude of all who are interested in Lady Elfrida, said Mr. Force. I thank you, sir. I did indeed act in the interest of the young lady. I went to Scotland with the young pair, and saw them properly married, in the parlor of the manse, by the minister, at Kilton, Dumfries, North Britain, and, in addition to the certificate given to the bride, I took a duplicate, duly signed and witnessed, because I thought it just possible the young lady might mislay or lose her lines. You are sure that the place at which you stopped for the marriage was Kilton, in Scotland, and not Kelton, a few miles south in England? inquired Mr. Force. Anglesia lifted his eyes from the paper in his hand, and looked at the questioner with surprise. They are so near together on the same line, and the sound of the names are so similar— that the mistake might easily have been made, on a night journey, Mr. Force explained. It might, but it was not. Here is the certificate. Will you examine it? said the general, laying the document before the squire. Sure enough, there was the printed heading. Parish of Kilton, Dumfries, N.B. And then followed the date and the record of the marriage between Luigi Saviola of Naples, Italy, and Elfrida Glennon of Northumberland, England signed by the minister, and attested by two witnesses. Abel Force heaved so deep a sigh of relief that Lord Enderby bent toward him and inquired, "'What is the matter? Why were you so anxious about this point?' 
I will tell you later. I will explain everything later. For the present, let us listen to the facts. I wish to put one question to you, Anglesia, and in the name of our lifelong friendship, why did you never inform me of my sister's marriage? Because, my dear fellow, I was in honor bound to keep the secret until the parties concerned announced their marriage. As I heard nothing about it from you or your father, I was restrained from mentioning the subject. I see, I see, assented the earl. I should not have brought up the matter now, had not the death of Saviola, and the marriage of his widow, absolved me from my implied pledge of secrecy, and very important considerations constrained me to cross the ocean to seek out Lady Elfrida, and to speak of her first marriage, of which I was the principal witness. I thank you, both on the part of Lady Elfrida and myself, for the great interest you have felt, and the great trouble you have taken in her cause, said Abelforce so earnestly, that Lord Enderby muttered to himself, I wonder what in the deuce has come over the squire, but I shall know presently, perhaps. I must explain these considerations, continued the general. I was at Naples last year, where I renewed my acquaintance with the aged prince, Antonio Saviola, whom I had known years before. We met at the house of a mutual friend. He invited me to dine tata tat with him on the next day, and to come early, as he wished to converse with me on a subject near. I accepted the invitation and went. Pardon, said the earl, what relation was Prince Antonio to Luigi Saviola? He was the granduncle of Luigi, who was his next of kin. When I reached the Palazzo Saviola, I was at once ushered into the presence of the prince, who received me in his library with much cordiality. He entered at once upon the subject in his mind by saying, You were the attendant of my grandnephew Luigi, on the occasion of his marriage with the only daughter of an English earl? Yes, sir, I answered, a little surprised that he should know the fact. So I was informed by a letter from my nephew soon after the occurrence. You were also his second in the fatal duel in Paris, about a year later, in which my nephew lost his life? No, prince, I was not in Paris at the time of that unhappy meeting, I answered. Then I have been misinformed upon that point, but there is no question of your having been a witness to his marriage. No question at all, prince, I was present in the interests of the lady, taking the place of her father or brother, one of whom should have been there to give her away. Precisely. That is how I understood from Luigi your presence at this Monahue and Capulet marriage. I have lost sight of the widow entirely. I last heard of her at Geneva. In a letter written to me by my unhappy nephew on the night before his duel, he told me that his wife was at the Beau Rivage, Geneva, expecting the birth of a child, that if he should survive the meeting of the next day he would hurry to her side. If he should fall, he recommended her to my sympathy and compassion. This letter found me prostrate with typhoid fever, and did not meet my eyes for weeks after it was written. My nephew was dead and buried. His widow had left Geneva, accompanied by her father and her infant. All my efforts to find them proved fruitless, and at last I gave up inquiry. Only lately have I become again interested in the subject. The reason is this. I am very aged, near ninety. My sons and grandsons have all gone before me to the better land. The last, Vittorio, departed some months since. I have no heirs, unless it happens that the posthumous child of Luigi proves to be a son, and is now living. It is to ascertain this point that I have called you here to-day. I could tell him nothing about the child, of whom I had never heard, but I offered to go to Geneva in person, and search the church register of the year and month in which the child of Luigi and Elfrida was born, and ascertain whether that child were son or daughter. I did so, and succeeded in procuring an attested copy of the registry of birth and baptism of Rolando, son of Luigi Antonio Saviola, and Elfrida, his wife. This I took to Naples, and laid before the old prince, together with the certificate of the marriage of Luigi and Elfrida. The old man was very near his end, but he lived long enough to acknowledge the boy as his legal heir, and to make a will, leaving him all his devisable property. For I feel sure the youth is living, amigo, he said fortune would not be so cruel as to cut off the entire family of Saviola. Those were his last words. After the funeral, I prepared to return to England, to search for Lady Elfrida and her son. Judge of my surprise when I learned, by a mere accident, that she had been with her family at Naples only a few weeks before. I went over to England, only to hear that she had sailed with all her party for America. I took ship and followed, 
looked for you in New York in vain, remembered that you had a country seat at Mondreer, Maryland, came down to Washington to-day en route for Mondreer, ran up against you, Enderby, in the street to-night. A lucky meeting, said the Earl. Yes, these documents before me are attested copies, the first of the certificates of the marriage between Luigi Saviola and Elfrida Glennon, the second of the registry of baptism of Rolando, their son, the third of the last will and testament of Antonio Saviola. These will establish the claim of the young man, who you say is alive and well, to the estate of his late uncle. When may I bring them to Lady Elfrida? Tomorrow, if you please, replied Mr. Force. The earl and the squire arose, and with renewed thanks bade the general good night. CHAPTER Forty Two, THE EARL'S DISCOVERY The church bells were chiming twelve, midnight, as the earl and the squire walked along the now almost deserted avenue toward their hotel. "'I had no idea it was so late,' said the earl. "'Nor I,' assented the squire. "'Force. Well, will you tell me now, as we walk along, why my sister's first marriage was kept a secret from me during all these years?' Why, even my chum in college, my fellow-soldier in camp, never once mentioned the matter to me? He has explained that in his case it was because no one spoke of it to him, and it was not his cue to be the first to allude to it. But why? Why was all this mystery about a marriage that was honorable enough in itself? Because there was a fatal misapprehension. I call it fatal, on account of the years of untold misery it entailed upon more than one. Explain. You remember, and can now at last appreciate, the dreary loneliness and isolation of your sister's childhood and early youth at Weird Waste? Oh, yes, yes. And the bewildering change that Brighton and a princely lover must have been to the hitherto solitary recluse of Weird Waste. Yes, yes. The fear of having to return to that desolation must have been as strong a motive as love itself in inducing her to fly to Scotland with her lover. Most probably— she had neither father, nor brother, nor any relative near her, no one but governesses and servants. Ah, my poor father never meant to be unkind, but it was cruel to leave her in that isolation. She found it so, and she listened to the pleadings of her lover, whom her imagination had elevated into a hero, martyr, patriot, and humanitarian, when, in fact, he was only a political refugee, on account of some hot-headed revolutionary utterances he had given. Yes, I heard of Saviola's exile while at Brighton, but I never met the man. I think your friend Anglesia had not met him at the time you were in Brighton. He first met Saviola at Lord Middlemore's, on Brunswick Terrace. You seem to be well informed on all points of this affair, Force. Pretty well, said the squire, but to proceed. Your sister went to Scotland to marry Saviola, escorted by your friend Anglesia, who, having done all he could to dissuade the Italian from running away with the young lady, and having failed, was resolved that the marriage that he could not prevent should at least be properly and legally solemnized. Yes, he told us that. And he told you also that he was bound to secrecy. Well, now to the point. When the newly married pair parted from Anglesia on the day of their marriage, they never saw him again. No? No. You heard Anglesia relate how the old prince, Antonio Saviola, supposed him, Anglesia, to have acted as second to Luigi Saviola on the occasion of his fatal duel with the Duke de Montmeri, and how he, Anglesia, had denied all knowledge of the tragedy? Yes, I did hear, and I remember that Anglesia was at that very time at college with me. Well then, Enderby, listen, if the bona fide Anglesia did not officiate as Luigi Saviola's second in that duel, his double, Burn Stukely, did. What? Yes, Anglesia's bet noir, Evil genius, material counterpart, Burn Stukely did. He personated Anglesia in Paris on the dueling ground, and at the death of Saviola, and in the apartments of Saviola's widow. Ah, what new infamy is this of which you tell me? I shall have to prosecute that villain, if he should escape the law here, exclaimed the earl. He will not escape the law here, but to proceed. Yes, yes. Stukely received the last dying messages from the lips of Saviola, and some little time afterward took them to his widow in Geneva. There, passing himself off for Anglesia, undetected, unsuspected by her, he delivered his credentials and won her confidence. But when he saw the beautiful young widow, he dared to think of her in a manner that should have brought down upon him severe chastisement. 
"'How? What?' demanded the earl, in an excited voice. "'Calm yourself, Enderby. Be patient, my friend. Here is our hotel. Shall we go in?' "'No, no, I cannot go indoors now. Let us walk here, where the night air cools my head. Unless you are tired, Force. "'No, I am not tired. We will walk on a little way. "'Well, go on.' With an artful delicacy, with sham sympathy, he approached the subject, and told Saviola's widow that she was, in fact, no widow at all, that her marriage with the late prince was null and void from the first, because it had been celebrated at Kelton, in Cumberland, England, instead of at Kilton, in Blankshire, Scotland. He manufactured plenty of false evidence to prove his falsehood to be truth, and then, and then, what, what? He insulted the lady with the offer of his heart, and— hand? Protection, murmured the squire. The earl sprang into the air, as if he had been shot, but came down upon his feet. He said nothing. There are some things that will not bear a single word of comment. This was one. She ordered the venomous reptile from her presence, and he crawled away, but left his poison sting behind. The consummate art of his false evidence had convinced her, as it afterward convinced her father, and later on, myself also, that her marriage ceremony with Saviola was an empty form, null and void. Her father never knew otherwise. She does not know otherwise to this day, and I knew no better until to-night. You believed my sister, your wife, to have been the victim of a false first marriage until to-night? Yes, until the moment when General Inglesia produced the certificate and told the true story. And yet you married her, "'Yes, thank heaven. I was permitted to marry her, and she has been the light of my life,' said the squire fervently. "'With this cloud overshadowing her. "'Enderby, every one of us has something to bear. "'This secret and its evil consequences have been our cross. "'We have had no other. "'We have loved each other truly, and we have been happy in our married life, "'notwithstanding our cross. "'Force, you are a noble fellow. "'But now about her son. "'Where is he?' Well, said the squire, smiling and hesitating, he is a very fine young man, a prisoner of war at present, but he shall be free to-morrow. Not Roland Bayard? Yes, Roland Bayard, as fine a young man as breathes. Then, after his mother, he is my heir. Yes, Anglesia has proved his legal right to be called so. Force, does the boy know of his parentage? No, his birth was a mystery to him, as it was to every one except me and his mother. He believes himself to be the son of Burns Stukely, and that is the reason why his tongue has been tied, so that he will not give the evidence that will clear himself and go near to hang Stukely. I see, I see. But he shall give it to-morrow, and be set at liberty. I shall see to that. Here we are again at the door of our hotel. Shall we go in? Or have you anything else to ask me? questioned the squire. No, nothing else to-night. Let us go in. The two gentlemen entered the house, got their chamber keys from the sleepy watchman, and went upstairs. The public parlors were dark and deserted. The gas burned low in the halls. The earl and the squire bade each other good night and separated, and went off to their several apartments. Mr. Force climbed another flight of stairs to seek the little room he had occupied since his wife's illness. He paused at the door of her sick chamber and knocked lightly. The night nurse answered the summons. "'How is Mrs. Force this evening?' he inquired. "'She is better, sir, and she is sleeping nicely,' replied the woman. "'Thank heaven! Good night,' said the squire, as he turned away and entered his own little room. He retired to bed, too happy to sleep until near morning, when at length he sank to rest. End of chapter 42《ポッドキャストで聞いてください。ポッドキャストで聞いてください。ポッドキャストで聞いてください。ポッドキャストで聞いてください。ポッドキャストで聞いてください。ポッドキャストで聞いてください。ポッドキャストで聞いてください。ポッドキャストで聞いてください。ポッドキャストで聞いてください。ポッドキャストで聞いてください。ポッドキャストで聞いてください。ポッドキャストで聞いてください。ポッドキャストで聞いてください。ポッドキャストで聞いてください。ポッドキャストで聞いてください。ポッドキャストで聞いてください。ポッドキャストで聞いてください。ポッドキャストで聞いてください。ポッドキャストで聞いてください。ポッドキャストで聞いてください。ポッドキャストで聞いてください。ポッドキャストで聞いてください。ポッドキャストで聞いてください。ポッドキャストで聞いてください。ポッドキャストで聞いてください。ポッドキャストで聞いてください。ポッドキャストで聞いてください。ポッドキャストで聞いてください。ポッドキャストで聞いてください。ポッドキャストで聞いてください。ポッドキャストで聞いてください。ポッドキャストで聞いてください。ポッドキャストで聞いてください。ポッドキ "'It is I, Papa,' said Wynnette, in a cheerful voice, and with a bright smile, that at once dispelled the squire's fears for his wife, which had been aroused by the summons. "'How is your mother?' he inquired. "'She is better, Papa. She is awake now. Dr. Bolton says that we may see her, but only one at a time. I thought you would like to be the first, so I came to call you. I did not know that you were still asleep. It is late, you see.' "'Yes, it is late, but I was up nearly all night.' 
Thank heaven that your mother is better. Come in, Wynnette. Hadn't I better leave you to dress, Papa? Presently, but I wish to send a line by you to your mother before I go to her. I will dress while you take it. Wynnette entered the room, closed the door, and sat down on the side of the little bed to wait for the line. Mr. Force went to the small stand and wrote, "'Dearest dear, I have read your paper, and I love you as ever, more than ever, if that were possible. For love is deepened and sanctified by sympathy with all that you have suffered. Send me word by our Wynnette if you feel well enough to see me. I am longing to be with you.' He folded the paper and gave it to his daughter, saying, Go in to see your mother, and when you have kissed and embraced her, give her this note and wait until she reads it. Then bring me any message that she may send. Wynnette took the missive, wondering a little why her father should send it, and left the room to deliver it. But Mr. Force had acted with prudent foresight. He feared that, in his wife's nervous and enfeebled condition, the sudden sight of him in her room, while she was yet in doubt about his feelings toward her, might have a disastrous effect upon her health. Therefore he had sent the short, loving message as a preparation for his visit. He dressed himself in a great hurry, and waited for the return of Wynnette. She came while he was drawing on his coat. "'Mama wants you to come at once and see her alone. She has sent out the nurse. "'How did you find her, Wynnette?' "'Oh, she is better. All right, I should think, except that she is very weak and as white as chalk. She cried when she read your note, Papa. Why did she cry, Papa? What was in your note?' She cried from nervousness, my dear. There was nothing in my note to distress her. I expressed the sympathy I felt, and asked her if she was able to see me, replied the squire, truthfully, as far as the words went, yet evasively. Oh, said Wynnette, and she was perfectly satisfied. I am going to see her now, said the squire, as he passed out of his own little room, and went to his wife's chamber. He opened the door and passed in. The window shutters were open, but the white shades were down, and the lace curtains drawn, so that the chamber was filled with a soft, dim, white light that showed the low French bed and the fair form upon it. As Mr. Force approached his wife, she put up her hands and covered her face. "'Elfrida,' he said, in low and tender tones. "'Oh, how can I look you in the face?' she murmured. "'How can I kiss you, dear, unless you take away your hands?' he said, gently removing them and pressing his lips to hers. "'Oh, Abel, if I could leave my bed, I should be at your feet. "'It is on my knees that I should receive your forgiveness,' she moaned. "'My dearest,' he whispered, kissing her again. "'My dearest, I do not offer you forgiveness, for you have done me no wrong. "'Oh, yes, oh, yes, I had a shameful secret, and I kept it from you, and married you. "'My love. "'No, no, my selfish feeling was not worthy of the name of love, yet what else can I call it? Whatever it was, it blinded me to honor and duty, and drew me on to marry you, with that shameful secret in my heart, she moaned. Dear wife, you are very morbid. Your secret was not a shameful one, and it was never kept from me, he answered, caressingly. What, Abel, what are you telling me? she inquired, starting up in bed. Lie down again, calm yourself, and keep very quiet, Elfrida. I have much to tell you, and I will tell you all. Confession for confession, my dear." "'The idea that you should have anything to confess. "'It is impossible, Abel,' she said, "'as she sank back on her pillow and lay quietly, "'as he had told her to do. "'Yes, Elfrida, confession for confession, "'for I knew your secret when we were married, "'but I never let you suspect that I knew it.' "'How?' she breathed in wonder. "'Your father told me when I asked him for your hand. "'The late Earl had insight enough into character "'to see that he could trust me, "'that I could never blame you "'for the deception he believed had been practiced upon you.' that I should consider you as truly an honorable widow, as if the marriage you believed to have been a fraud, had been as legal a bond, as it is now proved to have been. What, what are you saying, Abel? I, I cannot comprehend. I am telling you that Saviola married you in good faith, and that your marriage was as lawful as heaven and earth could make it. But lie still, keep quiet, and let me tell my story in my own way. You will then be able to comprehend it better." "'I will try,' she said, settling herself once more. "'You will remember that when I asked your father for your hand, "'he said that he must have a talk with you before he could give me an answer. "'Yes, he told me so, when he came to talk with me of your proposal. "'You remember that you refused me, all on account of that secret, which you would not reveal. "'I, not knowing why you refused me, but certainly knowing that you returned my love, "'declined to take no for an answer.' 
and so I continued to be a member of your father's traveling party. Yes. After some weeks, I again renewed my proposal for your hand to the earl, your father, begging his intercession with you on my behalf. It was then that he took me into his confidence and told me of the false marriage, into which, he believed, you had been led while yet a young, motherless girl in the schoolroom, and of the child that had been born of that marriage, and finally of the death of the man who had perpetrated the supposed wrong. It must have been a great shock to you. A shock that was without the least blame to you, my darling wife, so that when I recovered from it I told your father that you were in my eyes a blameless widow, and that I should be the proudest and happiest man alive if I could be blessed with your love and honored with your hand. Oh, Abel, generous soul! He then told me where the difficulty lay, that you imagined yourself so, so, well, so injured by the wrong which had been done you, or which you believed had been done you, that you could never bring yourself either to reveal it to me, or to marry me without having revealed it. No, I could not. I could have died, or lived in misery sooner. So your father told me. But I was a young man, in love, my dearest, and therefore ready with expedients. I said to the earl, I see a way out of all this. He replied, Tell me, for I see none. I answered, You have told me these antecedents, and your most fastidious sense of honor is satisfied. I know the secret, and still pray for the honor of your daughter's hand, as I believe I have already the blessing of her love. Pray, go therefore to your daughter, ask her if she considers you a man of honor and integrity worthy of her trust. Of course she will earnestly, and with wonder and indignation at such a question, assure you that she does. You will then please tell her of my renewed proposals, and assure her, in turn, that on your honor as a peer, and your faith as a Christian— she may accept my hand without revealing her secret, and without detriment to her conscience. The earl remained plunged in thought for a few minutes, and then replied, I believe you have found a way out of the labyrinth. I will do as you request upon one condition. I asked him what it was. He answered, That you never tell my daughter that you knew her secret. She is so morbid on that point. I believe she would die if she thought you knew it. I promised. And Elfrida, darling, you know the rest. We married, each having a secret from the other. Yours the secret of your first marriage. Mine the secret of the forbidden knowledge of that marriage. Did I not say that I should offer confession for confession? CHAPTER Thirty Four, LOVE STRONGER THAN FATE Oh, Abel, what did you think of me all that time? I thought you were the loveliest, yet the most morbid woman upon one point on the face of the earth— Often, when I looked at you and saw you preoccupied and very sorrowful, I wished that you would be brave enough to tell me your trouble, and so relieve your heart and find rest in my sympathy. But you never took courage to speak of it, and I was bound by my promise to the late Earl never to reveal my knowledge, unless you should first trust me with your secret. You have done so at last, and enabled me to make my confession also. And, oh, Abel, you educated my son— our son, I adopted him when I married his mother. Oh, Abel, noble heart! Hush, dear, I am but an honest and well-meaning man. At least I hope I am that much. As soon as we heard of the earl's death, I sent for the child, whom he had cared for while he lived. The boy was brought over in a Baltimore clipper, and I went to the city to meet him. I found the boy thriving, and I sent him down to Port Tobacco by sea, while I came home by land. I intended that he should be reared in Port Tobacco, where I could go to see him often and watch over his training. It was a stormy season, and I, traveling by the shorter land route, reached home fully a week before the tempest-tossed and battered carrier pigeon was driven upon our shores and wrecked with the loss of all on board, except the child alone, who was strangely saved. I should have taken him at once to our own home, but for consideration of you. I gave him in charge of Miss Bayard. In a day or two I knew that you had seen and recognized the boy. Then I noticed that any mention of the wrecked child distressed you, so I did all that I could for the little lad without forcing him upon your notice. My noble Abel, I have never deserved such a heart. No more of that, love. I think now that I have made a clean breast of it. I think I have told you all. Except this, you said that my first marriage was not a fraud but a legal act. Oh, is that true? "'And if true, how came you to know it?' inquired the lady. "'Oh, yes, I must explain that. "'And then, Elfrida, you must neither talk nor listen longer. "'You are exhausted. "'But tell me first, how do you know my first marriage was legal?' 
Do you remember the discovery we made the day before you were taken ill? The discovery that the villain who attempted to blackmail you and marry our heiress, under the name of Angus Anglesia, was not that gallant officer at all, but an impostor, taking advantage of the closest possible resemblance to Anglesia, to carry out his own nefarious purposes. Yes, a relative of Anglesia, Burns Stukely. The same. Well, twenty years ago, Anglesia and Stukely, I hate to connect their names, were exact counterparts, as you have heard. Well, this same Stukely was in Paris at the time that Saviola was there, and was taking the name and character of his benefactor. Saviola, deceived by the name and resemblance, mistook him for Anglesia, and asked him to act as his second. Stukely consented, and when Saviola fell, mortally wounded, the dying man entrusted the impostor with important papers and confidential messages to be delivered to you at Geneva. Now do you understand? Yes, I see. But he took his time in coming to Geneva, did not make his appearance there, indeed, until weeks after Saviola's death, when he came, I suppose, in the course of his own business. Well, my dear Elfrida, it must have been the sight of your beautiful face that tempted him to his subtle villainies, to use the papers and the information he really possessed in the manufacturing of false evidence, to convince you that your true and lawful marriage had been a fraud, in order to get you in his power. Yes, yes, but when and how did you discover that the marriage was really lawful, and that the evidence produced by Stukely was fabricated? By the appearance yesterday of the bona fide Angus Anglesia, who went with you and Saviola to Scotland, saw you married, and for your better security took an attested copy of your marriage certificate, which I have now in my possession. My brother's friend here, my brother's friend all that we first believed him to be, the vow he made to see me scathless through my mad marriage, kept to the letter, the shadow lifted from my life. Oh, I am so glad, so glad, and so grateful. Thank heaven, oh, thank heaven. Do not excite yourself, Elfrida, you promise to be quiet. Well, I will, I will be quiet. But I am so happy, happier than I have been for twenty-five years. What brought General Anglesia here? "'He came in search of you. He brought with him some papers that belonged to you,' said the squire. And then, while the lady listened with breathless interest, he told her of his accidental meeting with her brother's old friend on the avenue the night before, and of the long interview they had had in the apartments of the general, in which the latter had told of his visit to Naples, his chance encounter with the Prince Saviola, and all that had transpired on the occasion, which was followed a few weeks later by the death of the prince, who had left all his devisable estate to his grandnephew, Rolando, only son of Luigi Saviola, and his wife, Elfrida Glennon. And our dear friend took all the trouble to go to Geneva and hunt up the baptismal register of my son, and then to come across the ocean to find me out? And to bring you the copies of your marriage certificate, the register of your son's birth and baptism, and of your great-uncle's will. But my son, Abel, my son, she cried, our son's release is the question of a few hours only. He has been a voluntary prisoner because he has been grossly deceived by Stukely into the belief that he is Stukely's son. The lady gave a cry of horror, and he refused to testify against his supposed father. This morning Grandier, Anglesia, and myself will go to see him together and tell him the truth. He will no longer refuse to testify. We will then go to the commissioner of prisoners and ask him for an early hearing." If there should be any delay, we will go to the President. I think I can promise that he will be released before sunset. Heaven grant it, breathed the lady. And now, Elfrida, I must summon your nurse and leave you to repose. You had better not try to see anyone else today, not even the children. Anglesia will wait until tomorrow for an interview. One more word before you leave me, Abel. What is it? How came I back here in this bed? Where did you find me? I know I was crazed with trouble when I left that statement on the table and started on my journey. I have no distinct memory of that journey until I lost myself in a wild, dark, desert place, infested with wild beasts and birds of prey, and then oblivion, until I awoke to find myself in this bed. How did I get back? Who brought me home? You have never been away, dear Elfrida. Your howling wilderness was but a delirious dream. In your distraction you prepared to leave me, no doubt, but you never left the room. You were found by little Elva, dressed as for a journey, but lying in a swoon upon the carpet. You were put to bed, and skillfully treated, and you have got better. "'Is it possible?' murmured the lady, passing her hand dreamily over her forehead. 
"'It is true. "'And now, dearest, though I would much rather pass the whole day beside your bed, "'I must call your nurse and let you rest. "'You must not be disturbed again to-day,' said Abel Force, "'as he stooped and kissed her. "'She put out her arms, and drew his head down again, "'and returned his kiss, murmuring, "'Bless you, Abel. Bless you, bless you.' Then she released him, and he went softly to the door and opened it. Mrs. Winder, the sick nurse, was sitting on a chair a few feet off. She arose, and met the squire, saying reproachfully, "'You have stayed too long, sir. The doctor expressly said that no one must talk to my patient for more than five minutes, and you have stayed half an hour at least. It is very wrong, sir, indeed, very wrong, and I should not like to be responsible for the consequences.' "'You must pardon me on this occasion, nurse,' said the squire, good-humouredly. "'I hope I have done your patient no harm, and I promise that no one else shall disturb her to-day.' "'No, sir, they shan't. I will see to that,' answered the woman, with the despotism of her class. Mr. Force was too happy to be resentful. He went downstairs to the ladies' parlour, where he found a very large party waiting for him. Odalite, Elva, Wynnette, Mrs. Hedge, Miss Grandier, Miss Bayard, Rosemary, Captain Gideon, and young Sam. He bowed as he entered the room, where he was promptly met by Wynnette, who at once flew at him and pecked him with the words, "'Papa, you are a perfect outlaw. You were not given permission to stay more than five minutes in Mamma's room, and you have stayed about five hours, it seems to me.' "'Oh, tut, tut, tut! What reckless exaggeration! Not half an hour, my dear,' said the squire. "'And we are all just famishing. Here are our friends from the country, too.' They have got furnished apartments on E Street, but they have to come here for their meals, and they are just fainting with hunger. The squire thought they need not have waited for him, but might have gone down to breakfast under the escort of the old skipper, but he was too kind-hearted to say so. She is only teasing you, Mr. Force. She has no respect for the fourth commandment. We have but just arrived, and though we have excellent appetites for our breakfast, we are not suffering from hunger, said Mrs. Hedge. "'I know, Wynnette,' said the chick-packed papa, "'but now we will go downstairs at once. "'Where is Enderby, then? "'He went out to breakfast with a friend "'who has just arrived from England, "'but I didn't catch his name,' replied the skipper. "'Oh, I know. "'Miss Sibby, will you take my arm? "'Now, what do I want with your arm, Abel Force? "'Them as has arms and legs of their own,' says I, "'don't need to be toted along on other people's,' says I,' "'replied the old lady, trotting on before the party. "'End of chapter 44《Chapters forty five and forty six of When Shadows Die by E. D. E. N. Southworth. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Bridget Gage. Chapter forty five. Winding up. When the party returned to the drawing room, they found the earl and the general waiting for them. The squire greeted his friends and then introduced the general. The visitors from the country who had known the counterfeit to their cost were now very much pleased to make the acquaintance of the genuine officer. Presently, taking Anglesia aside, Mr. Force said to him, "'I have had a long interview this morning with my invalid wife. There has been a full explanation between us, but the excitement of such a conversation has exhausted her, and nurse and doctor forbid any more talk to-day, and enjoin absolute repose. Tomorrow she will see you. In the meantime, will you be so good, if you have no objection, to go with Captain Grandier and myself to one of our military prisons?' You need not fear anything unwholesome. The place is a miracle of cleanliness. A veteran of the East Indian Army need not fear the sight of a military prison, laughed the earl. But what may be the object of our visit? Mr. Force then explained the real position of Roland Bayard and of Burns Stukeley, and the deception that had been practiced by the slaver captain on his young prisoner, to persuade the latter that he was the son of the former, and to prevent him from giving the evidence that would clear himself and hang his supposed father. It is to abuse the young fellow of this false impression, and to prove to him his real parentage, that I wish you to accompany us to the prison, General, concluded Mr. Force. Of course, I will do all that with much pleasure. So my estimable relative Stukeley has wound up his career by turning pirate and slaver in these war times. Well, something of the sort might have been expected of him and his extradition has been demanded by the British government, I hear. These last words fell on the ear of Captain Grandier, who immediately answered, Yes, and when they get him they'll hang him, for they don't mince matters with such scoundrels as we do. But force, he added, turning to the squire, 
An article in this morning's paper, while it confirms the report about Stukely, denies that the extradition of Craven Cloud, or any other than the slaver captain, has been demanded. And that is plausible, too, for what time had they to hear of Craven Cloud, who has only passed a few weeks on board of the slaver by which he was taken prisoner? And who is Craven Cloud? demanded the general. Craven Cloud is the name our poor Roland took in his dire misery to save his own name from unmerited dishonor, and to save his friends from the knowledge of his possible fate. I am glad that he is not included in this demand of your government. So am I, for his extradition would have involved painful delays in getting his rights. Mr. Force then rang the bell and ordered a carriage, if one could be procured, to be at the door in twenty minutes. Then he went up to Rosemary Hedge, took her hand, and said, Dear little faithful heart, we are all going to get Roland out of prison. It may take us all day, for there may be lots of red tape to disentangle, but we expect to bring him back with us. Rosemary smiled gratefully. Did I hear you say you expected to bring my Roland back with you? inquired Miss Sibby. Yes, madam, replied the squire. Well, now, you do it, Abel Force. You better had, squire. If you don't, I'll walk myself right up to the president. I won't go to any of your secretaries, nor commissioners, nor any other understrappers. I'll walk myself right up to the President of these United States, and I'll demand of him why a brave and honorable young man, who is the adopted nephew of a descendant of the great Duke of England, is kept in prison. If you go to any one, says I, go to headquarters, says I. What does she mean by the Duke of England? inquired the general, in a low voice. Oh, she means a Duke of England, that is, Thomas, fourth Duke of Norfolk, one of whose younger sons came over to Maryland with Leonard Calver in 1633, and from whom Miss Bayard's mother was really descended, a fact which she never forgets or allows anyone else to forget. A long decline, you will say, but, my dear General, there are people descended from your English aristocracy, who are working on our roads or pining in our prisons, as there are also people descending from your English peasantry, who are filling the highest places in our social and national life. The waves of rank rise and fall like those of the ocean. "'Here we go, up, 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 and here we go, down, down, downy,' murmured Wynnette, who, standing nearest the speakers, had overheard with her sharp ears the low-toned words of this conversation. The carriage was now announced, and the three gentlemen left the room to go upon their visit to Roland in the old capital prison, putting the ladies under the care of Sam Grandier. Young Sam, too gallant to leave them, yet with his ruling passion strong, under all circumstances, proposed to take them to the agricultural college, and also to the agricultural grounds and conservatories. All the ladies consented to go, except Odalite, who decided to stay home for the chance of being admitted to see her invalid mother, and of receiving a visit from her lover, should his official duties give him time to call. But Lee found no opportunity to visit his sweetheart that day, and Odalite remained alone, unsummoned even by her mother, who, jealously guarded by her nurse, was kept in a state of complete quietude. She did not go down to lunch, because she disliked to enter alone the public dining-room, crowded as it was at all times with officers, soldiers, and civilians. She remained in the ladies' parlor, ate a few crackers, read a few newspapers, went occasionally to her mother's door to inquire after the patient, and hearing that she was resting quietly, returned to her parlor and her reading. So passed the day. It was late in the afternoon when Sam Grandier and his party returned from their sightseeing excursion. The ladies were hungry and fatigued, and anxious to get something to eat, and then go to the rooms and lie down. But Sam was full of the wonders of agriculture, horticulture, and floriculture, to which he had been introduced that day. If I was to be condemned for my sins to live in the city— which heaven in mercy forbid, and was allowed to choose the place of my punishment, it would be the agricultural college. I could stand that better than any other place, he said. And this was high praise coming from such a quarter. When they had all lunched, the grandiers and hedges returned to their lodgings in E Street to rest before dinner. They always went and came under protest, declaring that to sleep in one house and eat in another seemed to them so disorderly as to border on indecency. But Wynnette always quoted Sancho Panza, reminding them that travelers must be content, especially in wartime. It was dark when at length the three gentlemen returned to the hotel, with Lieutenant Force and Roland Bayard in their company. As they entered the parlor, Odalite sprang up with a little cry of joy, 
given no less to the released prisoner than to her betrothed lover. "'Is it all over? Is Roland quite free now?' she inquired, after she had shaken hands with both the young men. "'Well, no, not quite over, for Roland is detained here in Washington as a witness. Perhaps he will have to go to England as a witness. Find seats, gentlemen. I will tell you all about it, Odalite,' said Mr. Force. When they were all seated, the squire continued. "'We went from here to the old capital prison to see this knight, who was going to sacrifice himself upon a hallucination. Never mind that. You will understand by and by. Our friend here was enabled to give Roland the true history of his birth and parentage, being fully acquainted with all the facts and furnished with documents to prove them.' "'And who, then, is he, Roland?' inquired Odalite, with affectionate interest. "'Stay, my dear, not now. I cannot inform you just yet. You shall know his position presently. Now I wish to tell you how we released Roland. First we told his own story, and convinced him that he owed no duty to the impostor who had deceived him. Then we went to the commissioner of prisoners, without much success. Then to the secretary of war, without much more. Finally to the president, who, after hearing what we had to say, signed an order for Roland's release on parole. "'But why not release in full?' inquired the young lady. "'Because, my dear, there must be an investigation, and that takes time. However, he is practically free.'" CHAPTER Forty Six: REVELATIONS The ladies' parlor of the Blank Hotel in the city of Washington consisted of several rooms thrown into one by arches draped with curtains. It was the habit of the guests to collect in family or social groups in the several compartments of the saloon, where each circle could enjoy some privacy apart from the stranger inmates. On this warm evening in May, all the forces, except the mother, all the grandiers who were in Washington, the Hedges, Miss Bayard, Roland, General Anglesia, and the Earl of Enderby, were assembled in the rear alcove, at a safe distance from any other guests who might be in the parlor. For still greater privacy, the curtains of the arch had been lowered, and for coolness, the sashes of the bay window at the back had been raised. They thus enjoyed something like the seclusion of a domestic drawing-room. There was a gay group at the other extremity of the saloon, and the sound, but not the sense of their talk and laughter, sometimes reached our party in the rear alcove. But nothing that was spoken among the latter could possibly reach the ears of the former. The alcove was in pleasant shade this summer evening. Someone had asked leave of the others, and then had lowered the gas, to decrease the heat, as well as to subdue the light. The May moon, at its full, shone in through the open bay window, and softly illumined the interior, falling directly on the pale face of Abel Force, who occupied a large easy-chair in the midst of his party, who were seated around him, waiting in eager attention for his words. The squire of Mondrier began to speak in a somewhat formal manner. "'My friends,' he said, "'I have asked you all to meet me here, "'that I may explain to you some family matter "'that you have not hitherto understood, "'or rather, that you have entirely misunderstood up to this day.' "'The squire paused in some embarrassment. "'Miss Sibby took advantage of the momentary silence "'to nudge Miss Susanna Grandier and whisper, "'I note it. "'Everything as is hid, says I, is sure to come out, says I. "'But it's nothing again, able force, whatever it is, says I.' I'll bet on the old squire every time, says I. Mr. Force went on. You have all taken, or seem to take, much for granted in our lives, which was not true. Now did you not? Why, not that I know of, Force. I don't know of any mistakes we any of us ever made about you, exclaimed old Captain Grandier, answering for all his neighbors. In what respect have we done you wrong? he next inquired. In no respect have you done me wrong. You have only taken some things for granted, and made some harmless mistakes." What mistakes? These questions helped the embarrassed squire in his awkward explanations. Perhaps he drew them out for the purpose. For instance, he replied, you all took it for granted, when I married in Europe, that I had married a young lady who had never been married before. Yes, of course, replied the old skipper, while everyone else listened in silent expectation. You never imagined that I had married a young widow. "'Good heaven, no!' exclaimed the old sailor, opening his eyes to their widest extent. "'None of us ever could have dreamed of such a thing. So Mrs. Force was a widow when you married her?' "'Yes, the widow of the late Prince Luigi Saviola, of Naples.' "'Good gracious! And you never let on a word about it to any of us.' There was no occasion. The way did not open to make such an announcement, without apparent egotism,' replied the squire, discreetly, but not very convincingly." 
"'I confess I do not see where the egotism would have been,' said Miss Susanna Grandier. "'There may be a difference of opinion on that head,' said Abel Force. "'I could not go up and down the country, proclaiming aloud to all and sundry of my farmer neighbors that I had married the widow of the late Prince Luigi Saviola. Nor should I even mention the fact here among my old friends this evening, but that new developments of circumstances have made it necessary to do so. "'Needs must when the devil drives,' says I. "'Not that Abel Force has anything to do with the devil,' says I. "'No, indeed. I bet on Abel Force every time,' says I, muttered Miss Sibby, aside to Mrs. Hedge. "'Now, Squire, speak right up. Tell us all about it. You look as if you couldn't come to the point. You have got something more to tell us besides that you married a beautiful young widow. Out with it, Squire. We are all friends here,' heartily exclaimed old Gideon Grandier. Thus backed up and encouraged, the embarrassed and hesitating master of Mondrier took heart of grace, and told the story of his wife's first marriage. Not the whole story by a long deal. He suppressed much that did not concern his neighbors to be told, and would not have edified them to hear. For instance, he never hinted a word about the runaway marriage of the fascinating Italian exile, with the too romantic young schoolgirl. He merely told of the marriage of Prince Luigi Saviola of Naples, with the Lady Elfrida Glennon, only daughter of the Earl of Enderby, of their travels over the continent, and the birth of their only son at Geneva. He breathed no syllable of the fatal jewel in which the prince had fallen, but told them that he had died suddenly while on a visit to Paris, and that soon after his death his widow had returned to the protection of her father, in whose company he, Abel Force, had first met her in Switzerland, and that he had been so charmed with her that he had won her affections, and that he had married her some months later in England. At this point of the story Abel Force paused for a few moments, and then said, "'It would be too long and tedious a tale to tell you how we both became separated from our only son, that is, my wife's son by her first marriage, and my son by adoption and by affection, the young man whom you have known as Roland Bayard, but who, in truth, is no other than Rolando Saviola, the only son of the late Prince Luigi Saviola, and of the Lady Elfrida his wife. Enough that lately has come over from Europe this gentleman, General Anglesia, the long-time friend of my wife's family, who was present at her marriage with the prince, who was present also at the death of the lately deceased, aged Prince Antonio Saviola, and is the appointed executor of his will. General Anglesia has come to America in search of the heir, and has found him in the person of the young man, whom, as I have said, you have known so long as Roland Bayard." As Mr. Force concluded his narrative, a silence of astonishment fell on the circle. "'And now,' put in the Earl, "'I hope all our friends understood the position of my nephew here.' Old Captain Grandier started up and seized Roland's hand and shook it heartily. Little Rosemary slipped her slender fingers in those of the Earl and whispered, "'Didn't I tell you Roland was of patrician birth? Didn't I tell you he looked like you? I am not the least surprised.' The earl caressed the little hand that was resting in his, but made no reply in words. "'Yes, for all that I knew it all along, and am not surprised, I do feel as if I was hearing it all read out of a romance by the evening fire, in Aunt Suki's old room in the farmhouse,' added Rosemary dreamily. Lee followed the example of Captain Grandier, went up and shook Roland by the hand, whispering, "'I am heartily glad of your good fortune, old fellow, heartily glad.' Not that any fortune, good or ill, could affect my friendship for you. It is not likely, smiled Roland. If you did not lose faith in me when I was in the role of the pirate captain's mate, surely no amount of adversity could turn you against me. And as for prosperity, I know, Lee, that mine gives you unselfish joy. All now in turn shook hands with Roland, and wished him well. The young man cordially responded to all this sympathetic pleasure. Mr. Force's friends were not quite satisfied— all was not cleared up to their contentment. They wished to know how it happened that Roland had been separated from his parents in his infancy. But the mystery, which has been revealed to the reader, was never made clear to them, though subsequently various reports got into circulation concerning the lost child, the most popular of which, originating no one knew how, was that Roland had been stolen by gypsies. This romance came finally to be received as the truth." It was late that night when the party separated and retired to rest. End of chapter 46《Chapters 47 and 48 of When Shadows Die by E. D. E. and Southworth. 
This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Bridget Gage. Chapter 47. Mother and Son. The recovery of Elfrida Force was very rapid. When she awoke from sleep on the morning after her interview with her husband, she felt so free from pain and weariness, so refreshed in mind and body, that she wished to get up and dress and go down into the drawing-room to join her family circle. This the nurse dissuaded her from doing, but advised her to put on a wrapper, sit in an easy chair, and receive any friends she might wish to see in her own room. The first one she asked for was her husband. Abel Force came quickly, dismissed the attendant from the room, and sat down beside her, holding her hand in his own a few moments before either spoke. The squire was the first to break the eloquent silence. "'Dearest, you will be glad to hear that our Roland is at liberty, is fully exonerated.' "'Thank heaven,' breathed the mother. "'The morning's papers give us the information that Stukely will be yielded up to the British authorities, and will leave Washington to-day for New York, to sail on the Scotia, on Saturday, for Liverpool.' "'Thank heaven!' again breathed Elfrida Force. "'I have had an explanation with our friends and neighbors, "'have told them all that they need to know, and nothing more,' "'continued the squire. "'For the first time since his entrance, the lady looked uneasy. "'Do not distress yourself, my dear. "'I will tell you all that I said, and how I said it,' he added. "'And then he repeated, nearly word for word, "'all that had passed in the alcove of the lady's parlor "'on the preceding night.' "'Oh, Abel, how well you have managed to shield me, unworthy that I am, from all reproach,' she murmured, in a tremulous voice. "'Nay, dear, do not speak so of yourself. If I have tried to lift the burdens and dispel the shadows from about you, it is because it would have been unjust for you to suffer from them. And, Elfrida, I have had this morning an exhaustive interview with our son. "'Ah, yes, yes, what will Roland think of my long ignoring him?' sighed the mother." He knows now all about it, the cruel, slanderous deception practiced on you by the man Stukely, when he made you believe that the marriage with Saviola was illegal, and left you no other alternative than to do as you did. And no shadow of implied blame is felt by Roland, only reverential tenderness and compassion for all that you have had to suffer for so many years, from the diabolical villainy of one man. Roland is impatient to see you, my dear, as soon as you can admit him." "'My incomparable husband,' breathed the lady, penetrated by her perception of his utter unselfishness and superiority to every feeling of jealousy. "'Ah, how you exaggerate, dear,' he said with a smile. "'Then, will you see Roland?' he inquired. "'When you please,' she answered. He arose, stooped and kissed her forehead, and left the room. In a few moments the door opened, and Roland entered. The blood rushed to the lady's face, and then left it paler than before. She held out both hands to receive him. "'My son, oh, my son, can you forgive me?' she wailed. Roland dropped on one knee and lifted her hands to his lips in silent reverence. Then he arose and folded her in his arms, still in silence. "'Speak to me, Roland,' she said at last, when he had drawn a chair and seated himself at her side. "'Dear mother,' he said very gently, "'I have heard your whole story from the lips of my stepfather.' my honored father, I should rather say, for truly he has done a father's part, and given a father's love to me, and I feel for him the deepest love, respect, and compassion. I wish from my soul that at my hands the demon who has wronged you so bitterly could receive his punishment. No, no, my son, from your hands his punishment would be sinful revenge. From the hands of the law which has seized him, it will be retributive justice." "'Roland, how much, if anything, can you remember of your infancy "'before you were cast upon these shores?' she suddenly inquired. "'Not very much clearly, dear mother, but I do remember a country place "'where there were many cows and some calves, fruit trees, flowers, "'and a house covered all over with flowering vines. "'I remember a rosy-cheeked woman in a white cap and white apron "'who used to wash and dress me, and another little boy of about my age, "'and give us our milk and bread in a room that had a bright red brick floor.' "'Nothing more, Roland?' "'Oh, yes, I remember something that used to make a grand holiday for us, "'a great lady who used to come to see us "'and bring cakes and sugar-plums and toys and clothes. "'Then I remember being in a ship on the sea for many days, "'but cannot recall how I got there or how I came away. "'These reminiscences I have often told to Aunt Sibby, "'but neither she nor I could ever make out by much study "'where that home of my infancy could have been located.' 
or what seas I had sailed over. "'And did no face, no voice here ever associate itself with those earlier memories?' inquired the mother. "'Yes,' replied the young man. "'I was but four years old when I last beheld the face of the beautiful woman who visited me at intervals, and whom I had been taught to call my aunt. But this last occasion was fixed in my memory from the childish delight I found in the hobby-horse she had brought down for me, and also by something very opposite that, my distress at seeing her great griefs and paroxysms of sobs and tears at leaving me. These impressed the lady's face and voice indelibly on my memory, so that the image and the tone survived everything else in my picture of the past. I was ten years old when I first saw Mrs. Force at our school examination, but her face and her voice troubled me with fancies that they had both once been familiar and beloved. Mother, I remembered your presence in the home of my infancy, though I remembered little else about it, and I recalled your face and voice when I met you again six years later on this side of the world, though I could not identify you with the angel of my fancy. Yet I always loved you in both characters, though I never ventured to show my affection, and I somehow perceived your love for me, though you never showed it. A veil was between us, said Elfrida Force. Yes, a veil, but so thin that we saw each other through it. Why, mother dear, even our little Rosemary perceived this, for she often told me that she believed you loved her for my sake more than for her own. Today she told me that when she was in distress on my account, it was only to you she could go for sympathy. And that was true, murmured the lady. And, mother dear, what treasures I have realized in my new-found sisters— Odalite, always kind to me because Leonidas loved me. Odalite has been most affectionate to-day. Wynnette, charming Wynnette, has been so openly fond of me as to rouse the jealousy of Mr. Samuel Grandier, who remonstrated in elegant style this way. Drot it all, Wynnette. You make more of Roland than you ever did of me, though I am to be your husband. And what did our Wynnette say to that? inquired Mrs. Force, with a smile. She answered, Well, it is written that a man shall forsake his father and his mother, and cleave to his wife. But it is nowhere written that a woman shall forsake her darling brother to cleave to another fellow. And she hugged me tighter and kissed me closer than before. And little Elva? inquired the lady. Sweet Elva, tender, loving Elva. She could not ever have been sweeter, kinder, tenderer to me than she has always been. Elva is the sweetest of all my sweet sisters. She is a dear child, breathed the lady. Then, after a little pause, "'And Rosemary?' she inquired. "'Mother, with your consent, and I am sure we shall have your consent, "'Rosemary will be my wife. "'Dear, true-hearted little mite, "'she would have given herself to me, "'even if I had been nothing more than a little skipper's mate, "'under the ban of suspected piracy. "'Her love for me was so warm, her faith in me so true. "'I am glad that I have the rank and wealth to offer her "'which will make me acceptable to her relations.' "'But, mother dear, General Anglesia is waiting to speak to you. "'Then go and bring him in, and, Roland, you need not retire,' said the lady. CHAPTER Forty Eight, THE MEETING OF OLD FRIENDS Angus Anglesia entered the room, ushered in by Roland, and followed by Mr. Force. Mrs. Force arose from her chair to meet her old friend, who took her hand and bowed over it respectfully. "'I am very glad to see you after so many years,' said Mrs. Force, as Roland drew forward a chair for the visitor. "'I wish, with all my heart and soul, that our meeting had been earlier. It would then have saved much misunderstanding and suffering,' said General Anglesia, with a deep sigh, as he took his seat by her side. "'The past is past,' said the lady. "'Every one in this world has something to bear. All things considered, we have had but a small share of the universal burden,' cheerfully remarked Abel Force. "'I have brought some very important documents here to place in your hands,' said Anglesia, beginning to sort a parcel of papers that he held. "'You have taken much trouble to bring me these documents. How can I thank you sufficiently?' murmured the lady. "'But I need no thanks for doing my duty. This is the will of the late Antonio Saviola, by which he leaves all his possessions to his grand-nephew, Rolando Saviola,' said the general, laying the largest document on a small stand in front of the lady's chair." She bowed and took it up. "'This is the certificate of your marriage, with Luigi Saviola, and this is a certificate of the baptism of your son. These documents were necessary to establish your son's right to the inheritance of the Saviola estates,' he continued, placing two other papers on the table. These also the lady took up, with a bow of thanks. 
Mr. Force will tell you how all these came into my possession, if he has not already done so. And now, dear lady, having surrendered my trust, I must take my leave for the present. I have been cautioned by your physician, who is waiting in the parlor below, not to make my visit too long. I shall remain in Washington some time, and I hope I shall be permitted to see you often, said Anglesia, as he arose to leave the room. Must you go? Then return soon, come often. Do come and spend the evening with us. I am quite recovered, I assure you, and shall join my family party in the drawing-room after dinner, said the lady, detaining the hand that he had given her. I will do so with pleasure, returned the general, and with a low bow he relinquished her hand and left the room. His exit was followed by the entrance of the doctor to make his daily visit. He expressed much satisfaction on finding his patient so much improved, and when Mrs. Force spoke of her wish to join her family in the drawing-room, the doctor made no objection to the proposed measure. As soon as he had gone, the lady dismissed her other two visitors, Abel Force and Roland, telling them that she meant to dress and go down into the parlor, where they might rejoin her. The two men left the room. A half-hour later, Elfrida Force was seated in the alcove at the rear of the saloon, surrounded by her daughters, her young friends, and her old Maryland neighbors, all of whom rejoiced over her as one who, if not risen from the dead, had at least passed safely through a terrible crisis and risen from a most dangerous illness. All the gentlemen of the circle were absent, having gone with Roland, who was to pass through some necessary formalities before he could be released from bonds and set entirely at liberty. So it turned out that the large party in the alcove was a hen convention, and the subject they discussed was a double wedding, when and where to come off. Leonidas had that day pleaded for an immediate marriage, urging, with much reason, the long time that he and his beloved had been obliged to wait, and the repeated disappointments they had been fated to suffer. And Mr. Force had replied that he would consult Mrs. Force on the subject, and give him an answer as soon as possible. Mr. Force had, in fact, resolved to leave the matter to be determined by his wife. Roland had also pleaded for an early wedding, arguing that he would be compelled to go to Italy to take possession of his estates, and that after all that he and his sweetheart had endured, they might really expect to be made happy. Mrs. Hedge and Miss Grandier promised to take the matter into consideration, and give him an answer in due time. And now all the women and girls were freely discussing the subject. There should be a double wedding, that was a fixed fact. Leonidas and Odalite, Roland and Rosemary, should be married at the same place and at the same time. But in what place and what time? In the city of Washington, within a week— or in St. Mary's County, within a month. That was the question that occupied the ladies' circle. There was so much to be said on both sides. It would save time, trouble, and expense to have the double wedding come off in Washington. But then, as Roland and Rosemary were to sail for Europe immediately after their marriage, it seemed a pity that they should not look once more upon old scenes and meet once more old friends before their departure. You see, the matter resolved itself at length into a question of convenience or of sentiment, and inasmuch as it was a convention of women who sat upon the subject, the decision may be anticipated, as given in the favor of sentiment. The weddings, therefore, were to be celebrated with great pomp at All Faith Church, Mondrier and Oldfield, in St. Mary's County. That is to say, the double marriage ceremony was settled to be performed at All Faith Church, the wedding breakfast to be served for both parties at Mondrier, and the evening reception to be held at Oldfield. After which Leonidas and Odalite would depart to spend their honeymoon at their own little estate of green bushes, and Roland and Rosemary would leave for New York en route for Europe. The ladies had settled this quite to their satisfaction before the gentlemen all returned with the good news that all formalities had been duly observed, and now Roland was a free man, without the smallest suspicion of a blemish on his honor. And now, said Abel Force, we may all go down into Maryland, as soon as we please, and show Enderby and Anglesia what our country life is like, for they have both promised to be our guests for a season. That will be delightful, and I am rejoiced to hear it, said Mrs. Force, very cordially, at which the two invited guests bowed. Later on that evening, when Elfrida Force found herself alone with her husband in their chamber, she said, We cannot go down to Mondrier in less than a week. I must write to-morrow to have the house prepared for the reception of our visitors. And while that work is going on, I must do some shopping here for the two girls. You know they cannot be married without clothes. 
"'Without clothes! Good Lord, no!' exclaimed the squire, and he gave in immediately. The next day Mrs. Force wrote to her housekeeper at Mondreer, addressing that worthy woman as Mrs. Anglesea, lest with her true name on the envelope the missive might not reach her, or if it did, might offend her, but addressing her so for the last time, for after announcing the advent of her family and visitors at Mondreer, and instructing the housekeeper in regard to the preparations to be made for their accommodation, Mrs. Force wrote briefly of the facts which had come to light concerning the impostor who had called himself Colonel Angus Anglesea, but who was really Burn Stukely, an ex-midshipman in the Royal Navy, long an adventurer, and lately a pirate. She suppressed only one fact, the existence of Stukely's wife and family at Angleton, and this she kept in mercy to the deceived woman, since there could be no good come of revealing it. She ended by advising the Californian to drop the name Anglesea, to which the man who had given it to her had no sort of right, and to take back that of her late husband, who had had every claim on her love and faith. She counseled her to do this the more especially as the real Angus Anglesea was to be one of their visitors at Mondreer. Having dispatched this letter by the morning's mail, Mrs. Force ordered a carriage, and in company with Mrs. Hedge, Odalite, and Rosemary, drove out to purchase wedding finery for the two brides-elect. Two days later, all the Grandiers, together with Mrs. Hedge, Rosemary, and Miss Sibby Bayard, left Washington for St. Mary's, partly on account of the expense and inconvenience of sleeping in lodging houses and eating at hotel restaurants, and partly as an advance guard to go before and prepare the way for the wedding parties. Mr. and Mrs. Force, with their family and guests, expected to follow in about ten days, or as soon as the wedding outfit for the two brides could be completed, for the lady had undertaken the supervision of that part of the program. Young Sam Grandier had pleaded hard to be allowed to marry Wynnette, at the same time that Leonidas was to marry Odalite, and Roland Rosemary. And neither Mr. nor Mrs. Force raised any objection. But Wynnette herself resisted the proposal in a characteristic way. No, she said, we must not think of marrying or giving in marriage, while our countrymen are falling in battle or dying in hospitals by thousands and tens of thousands, many also perishing for want of help and not hands enough at leisure from business or from pleasure to give it. No, I suppose it is necessary that these others should marry for good reasons, but you and I must wait for better time, Sam, because as soon as the double wedding is over and the two happy pairs gone, Elva and I intend to return to Washington and go to work in the hospitals. In the hospitals, what can you two do? had been Sam's amazed exclamation and incredulous question. We may not be first-rate nurses, but we can help the nurses. We can obey orders, step lightly, speak softly, fetch and carry, and do any work we are put to do, and we mean to do it. And your father and mother mean to let you? Of course they do. That is what we all came home from Europe for. And Papa and Mamma mean to offer their services, too. Well, if it were not for you and your parents, Wynnette, I should say that you were all the biggest fools in the world, and that each one of you was the biggest fool of all the rest." exclaimed the provoked lover. And if it were not you, who couldn't hit me back because you are a man and I am a girl, I should box your ears soundly for saying that, Mr. Samuel Grandier. Oh, I shouldn't mind that, said Sam, with a laugh. And the honest young pair parted good friends, Sam going to escort his relations on their journey to St. Mary's. End of chapter 48《ハッピーバースデートゥーユー》ハッピーバースデートゥーユー《ハッピーバースデートゥーユー》《ハッピーバースデートゥーユー》《ハッピーバースデートゥーユー》《ハッピーバースデートゥーユー》《ハッピーバースデートゥーユー》《ハッピーバースデートゥーユー》《ハッピーバースデートゥーユー》《ハッピーバースデートゥーユー》《ハッピーバースデートゥーユー》《ハッピーバースデートゥーユー》《ハッピーバースデートゥーユー》《ハッピーバースデートゥーユー》《ハッピーバースデートゥーユー》《ハッピーバースデートゥーユー》《ハッピーバースデートゥーユー》《ハッピーバースデートゥーユー》《ハッピーバースデートゥーユー》《ハッピーバースデートゥーユー》《ハッピーバースデートゥーユー》《ハッピーバースデートゥーユー》《ハッピーバースデートゥーユー》《ハッピーバースデートゥーユー》《ハッピーバースデートゥーユー》《ハッピーバースデートゥーユー》《ハッピーバースデートゥーユー》《ハッピーバースデートゥーユー》《ハッピーバースデートゥーユー》《ハッピーバースデートゥーユー》《ハッピーバースデートゥーユー》《ハッピーバースデートゥーユー》《ハッピーバースデートゥーユー》《ハッピーバースデートゥーユー》《ハッピーバースデートゥーユー》《ハッピーバースデートゥーユー》《ハッピーバースデートゥーユー》《ハッピーバースデートゥーユー》《ハッピーバースデートゥーユー》《ハッピーバースデートゥーユー》《ハッピーバースデートゥーユー》《ハッピーバースデートゥーユー》《ハッピーバースデートゥーユー》《ハッピーバースデートゥーユー》《ハッピーバースデートゥーユー》《ハッピーバースデートゥーユー》《ハッピーバースデートゥーユー》《ハッピーバースデートゥーユー》《ハッピーバースデートゥーユー》《ハッピーバースデートゥーユー》《ハッピーバースデートゥーユー》《ハッピーバースデートゥーユー》《ハッピーバースデートゥーユー》《ハッピーバースデートゥーユー》《ハッピーバースデートゥーユー》《ハッピーバースデートゥーユー》《ハッピーバースデートゥーユー》《ハッピーバースデートゥーユー》《ハッピーバースデートゥーユー》《ハッピーバースデートゥーユー》《ハッピーバースデートゥーユー》《ハッピーバースデートゥーユー》《ハッピーバースデートゥーユー》《ハッピーバースデートゥーユー》《ハッピーバースデートゥーユー》《ハッピーバースデートゥーユー》《ハッピーバースデートゥーユー》《ハッピーバースデートゥーユー》《ハッピーバースデートゥーユー》《ハッピーバースデートゥーユー》《ハッピーバースデートゥーユー》《ハッピーバースデートゥーユー》《ハッピーバースデートゥーユー》《ハッピーバースデートゥーユー》《ハッピーバースデートゥーユー》《ハッピーバースデートゥーユー》《ハッピーバースデートゥーユー》《ハッピーバースデートゥーユー》《ハッピーバースデートゥーユー》《ハッピーバースデートゥーユー》《ハッピーバースデートゥーユー》《ハッピーバースデートゥーユー》《ハッピーバースデートゥーユー》《ハッピーバースデートゥーユー》《ハッピーバースデートゥーユー》《ハッピーバースデートゥーユー》《ハッピーバースデートゥーユー》《ハッピーバースデートゥーユー》《ハッピーバースデートゥーユー》《ハッピーバースデートゥーユー》《ハッピーバースデートゥーユー》《ハッピーバースデートゥーユー》《ハッピーバースデートゥーユー》《ハッピーバースデートゥーユー》《ハッピーバースデートゥーユー》《ハッピーバースデートゥーユー》《ハッピーバースデートゥーユー》《ハッピーバースデートゥーユー》《ハッピーバースデートゥーユー》《ハッピーバースデートゥーユー》《ハッピーバースデートゥーユー》《ハッピーバースデートゥーユー》《ハッピーバースデートゥーユー》《ハッピーバースデートゥーユー》《ハッピーバースデートゥーユー》《ハッピーバースデートゥーユー》《ハッピーバースデートゥーユー》《ハッピーバースデートゥーユー》《ハッピーバースデートゥーユー》《ハッピーバースデートゥーユー》《ハッピーバースデートゥーユー》《ハッピーバースデートゥーユー》《ハッピーバースデートゥーユー》《ハッピーバースデートゥーユー》《ハッピーバースデートゥーユー》《ハッピーバースデートゥーユー》《ハッピーバースデートゥーユー》《ハッピーバースデートゥーユー》《ハッピーバースデートゥーユー》《ハッピーバースデートゥーユー》《ハッピーバースデートゥーユー》《ハッピーバースデートゥーユー》《ハッピーバースデートゥーユー》《ハッピーバースデートゥーユー》《ハッピーバースデートゥーユー》《ハッピーバースデートゥーユー》《ハッピーバースデートゥーユー》《ハッピーバースデートゥーユー》《ハ
in chains i hope and they'll hang him by all accounts they don't fool with such people as we do they hang em and now luce don't you ever dare to call me by that devil's name again and if anybody else ever does call me so i'll sue em for slander and put the damages as high as the law allows exclaimed the old housekeeper all yight old mistis i won't call yer dat but what must i call yer call me mrs wright wright is my right name and i shall always write it so for all of that marriage right between me and that yonder beat just so old mistis i'll member it was my dear old man's name and i ought never to have changed it and i never will again so help me and now luce you and me has got to stir our stumps and make this house jam for there's not only two weddings and lord knows one wedding make fuss enough in a house but there's a whole raft of foreign company coming to stay i taught as there was only two strange gemmen well but one's a lord and t'other a lion and them two's as much as a regiment so look alive nigger and put your best foot first before the foreigners said the housekeeper with vim while active preparations were in progress at mondreer all the grandiers with mrs hedge little rosemary and miss sibby bayard returned to the neighborhood the sensational news they brought from washington spread like wildfire through the county and the capture of the kitty by the argent the taking of the argent by the eagle the detection of the true character of the adventurer whom they have known and lionized as colonel angus anglesea the discovery of roland bayard's parentage the approaching marriage of leonidas with odalite and of roland with rosemary formed the topics of conversations at all the tea-tables and in all the bar-rooms for many miles around in the height of all this gossip the forces with their two foreign guests returned to mondreer they immediately became the objects of daily yes hourly calls every acquaintance of the family high and low rich and poor came to welcome them back to mondreer and all were received with courtesy invitations were sent out broadcast for the double wedding to be celebrated at all faith church on the first of the ensuing june when that day dawned at length the sun arose in a sky as bright and blue and shone upon a world as green and fresh as ever blessed the bridals of youth and beauty at a very early hour the church was filled with the nearest friends of the wedding parties while scores of invited guests who could not press into the building for want of space sat in their carriages that filled the grove at ten o'clock the venerable clergyman appeared in the chancel robed in his white surplice and attended by his curate and clerk and with their appearance a whisper went around the congregation that the bridal procession was approaching this was true a moment later the doors were noiselessly thrown open and the ushers entered standing on the right and on the left then the bride odalite appeared leaning on the arm of her father her dress on this occasion was very plain and simple a white silk trained and a long white tulle veil with a very slender wreath of orange buds gloves boots handkerchiefs and bouquet to match but no jewelry behind her walked her bridesmaids wynnette and elva girls even more simply dressed in white than herself a few steps in the rear came the second bridal train little rosemary hedge led by her great uncle captain gideon grandier she looked like a light floating cloud with veil and dress of all snow-white tulle looped here and there with lilies of the valley behind her walked her two bridesmaids the little elk girls in simple white organdy dresses last of all came mrs force with the earl of enderby and other friends and mrs hedge with miss susanna grandier as odalite was led up to the altar by her father leonidas force came out of the vestry followed by his groomsman sam grandier and joined them the circle immediately arranged itself before the altar the friends of the pair standing behind and on the right and the left the venerable rector opened his book and the rites commenced odalite was a palace bride that ever willingly gave her hand to her chosen bridegroom but then the shadow of the past overclouded her spirit leonidas perceived this and pressed her hand in silent sympathy and reassuring tenderness the rites went on to the end the benediction was given and the bride and groom were warmly congratulated then the newly married pair with their attendants withdrew to the rear to make way for the second wedding old captain grandier led his niece rosemary hedge up to the altar followed by her bridesmaids there they were met by roland saviola and his groomsman ned grandier they formed before the altar their friends and relatives standing behind and on either side 
Again the rector advanced and opened his book, and amid the deep silence commenced the solemn rites. When they were ended, and the blessing was bestowed, the bride kissed, and the bridegroom shaken by the hand, both the wedding parties withdrew to the vestry to register the marriages. After this they made very slow progress out of the church, their way being impeded by their acquaintances, who left the pews to offer their congratulations. At length they were permitted to enter their carriages, and take the road to Mondrier, where the marriage breakfast was to be given. It was a great success, of course. The guests remained until two o'clock, when they departed, well pleased, and leaving their entertainers to take a few hours' repose, before repairing to Oldfield for the evening's ball. At the farm they all literally danced all night till broad daylight. Then, after coffee, the two brides and grooms put on their traveling dresses and took leave of their friends. Leonidas and Odalite went to Greenbushes to spend their honeymoon quietly. Roland and Rosemary left for Washington, en route for New York and Paris. Mrs. Hedge and Miss Grandier wept freely at parting with their darling, but were consoled by the assurance from Roland that the trip across the Atlantic was nothing at all in these days, and that he should certainly bring Rosemary back to spend Christmas with them, and afterward, if they pleased, take both of them to Europe to spend a long time with Rosemary and himself. To Miss Sibby Bayard, who had been a true mother to the young man, and who was weeping silently and wiping her eyes surreptitiously, as if she were ashamed of her tears, Roland said, "'Dearest Aunt Sibby, though I seem to be leaving you finally, yet it is not so. You will see me much oftener, and for much longer periods, than you used to do when I was mate on a merchantman, and away to sea three years at a time. Besides, you will come and stay with us on the other side as often and as long as you please. Forever, if you will. We should like it.' "'Yes, honey, never mind me. I'm not crying. What should I cry for when you are so happy? I love you too true for that. Rail love, says I, always rejoices in the good of its objects, says I. And them as snivels at the happiness of their children, says I, hasn't much love but a deal of self in their souls, says I, Miss Sibby concluded, with a glance of reproach on poor Mrs. Hedge and Miss Grandier. At last they were gone, and the invited guests soon followed. Oldfield was left to itself except for the presence of the forces, who, being very tired, had accepted Mrs. Grandier's pressing invitation to remain and rest for the whole day. They all retired to their rooms to lie down and sleep, all except the California widow, who, with her instincts of order, volunteered to help put the farmhouse to rights after the party. She called to her aid Luce, who had come to Oldfield in attendance on her mistress. Luce's eyes were red, and her nose was swollen through much crying. "'Now come out of that, you fool!' exclaimed the widow, who had finished with her own crying. "'I can't help a bit,' sobbed Luce. "'These yer boys and gals is nuff to break a body's heart. Allers everlastin' gettin' married world without end. But what's de use of talkin'? It's a habit they gibs derselves. Nuffin' tall but a habit they gibs derselves. And they'll never be broke of it. Never!' "'Oh, hush, Luce, look up, look up, woman, there is a good omen, the sun is rising. The End End of chapter 49 End of When Shadows Die by E. D. E. N. Southworth